but I'll send you, like, you'll download my audio and there's like 10 minutes of just my side of a conversation. Yeah. There's a few <laughs> times where I'm like, so when this is when she up. actually pressed record. <laughs> Fucking Kate, try to get more airtime. She's just. I can't <laughs> help it. I'm an air hog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bush That's pig. A... <laughs> <laughs> I'm an air hog. You're a bush pig. Together we make a cute little farmyard. Menagerie. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kate. Hi, Dom. How are you today? I'm what? Fabulous. Fabulous. Oh, oh. <laughs> I even enjoy the, I'm good. I enjoy our preamble. Always leads us to laugh about something. So whenever we say hi, Kate, hi, Dom, it's we're always giggling. <laughs> wow, oh. we're getting into some pretty serious shit. So I think it's probably good that we start off with a giggle before things get too serious. And then you start educating us about phobias and survival and oh my gosh. Did you know have you read today's episode? Because I have both of those things in this. Oh, really? What are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> it's like we have a formula. I know. It's so boop, bizarre. Boop, boop. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do our episodes. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, <laughs> today, you may have read on the um, the Spotify, the Apple or the Pod or the something, other Deezer. Is that yeah. one? Boom. Today's <laughs> episode is entitled 127 Hours. That is not how long the podcast will go for. Maybe it will. Who knows? Just strap in and you'll find out. It strap is cool. on, strap on, <laughs> strap in, whatever you fancy. Uh, I am going to talk about the the true story of 127 hours. So I will get into that a little bit and you'll learn more about it. If it's not ringing any bells, uh, it will soon because oh. it's very sort of pop culture It's in the media. It's all of that sort of stuff. So I'm sure you've heard of it. You've heard of it, Dom. You know what I'm going to talk about. I had only heard of it because of the movie i okay. must admit i'm one of those people that had never heard of the story before and then the movie came out and i'm obviously we all know that dom's rather obsessed with survival stories but <clears throat> i was just so afraid of actually watching this film because there's the scene mm. <clears throat> and i just thought i'm not going to be able to handle this because it's just too confronting a scenario yeah where when i watch movies i always put myself in the movie so Oh, that's interesting. I'm very curious to hear your version of the story, but do we have a Boopod Network shout out for this week? Is we 100% do have a Boopod Network shout out for this week. And it is one that was sort of um, our Ridgy Ditch. Yeah. Like one of our first partners. Is that right? It's, you know, one of those ones that is. Uh, yeah, our first little start of our network, which is super duper curate and we love. Um, so huge shout out to today, our Boo Pod Network is the Haunted UK podcast. Hi, Steve. We love Hi, you. Steve. Yeah, it was Steve that actually reached out to us first and asked us to join a network of pods that he had set up. And, or maybe I reached, I don't know, someone reached out to someone, Kate. That's it. It was a collective reaching out. Everyone was reaching out, reach around, all the reaches. It was a time. <laughs> God, this is a very sexual episode. I'm quite I'm here sorry. for it. Gosh, I better, yeah, I'm, I'm here. We're here. Yeah. It's okay. But, yeah, Steve, he's really, really sweet. He, um, beautiful British accent, is so committed to all of his creative endeavours and his podcast is uber spooky, uber scary, like he's probably got a, he's got a voice made for podcasting and radio so um highly recommend checking out if the spookiness is your thing your jam absolutely so you can, it is haunted uk and have a little promo for us mm -hmm. boopity boop boop boopity boop boop oh my god i love it the voice <laughs> the voice yeah. it's the voice for me yeah, he is. He's yeah. He's very charismatic. You know that sort of charm. So it's great for great for scary stories. Thank you so much, Steve. And yes, UK uh, Haunted UK podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow, have a listen. Uh, we just want to continue to support the little Boo Pod network we've set up. It's so cute, and I love it. We love you guys. Dab, double dab. 
Probably dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> back into today's EPO. Uh, EPO, that's what we're calling them now. It's yep. an EPO. I want to start off with a phobia because that's what I like to do. Yeah. So we may talk a little bit about claustrophobia. Yes. Today, but we will actually be speaking more about clethrophobia. Now, I'm going to describe the difference between these two because they are similar, but they are slightly different. Okay. So, claustrophobia, which you may be aware, it can occur anytime. So, if you've mm. got claustrophobia, you might fully intend to enter a small space, such as like an MRI machine or something, um, but you'll have a panic attack before that happens because you're like yeah, preempting, I'm going into a small space, I'm panicking. Um, yeah. before anticipation, you know. right? Correct. That's right. Um, so the specific focus of the phobia is the small space. That's the fear. Mm -hmm. Clethrophobia is triggered by the actual confinement in a small space. So people with clethrophobia are usually comfortable going into a small space as long as they can leave, as long as they're free to leave. But if they get, you know, trapped, locked in, you know, stuck, that's when they will start to panic. Oh, so yeah. usually the sort of slight difference, so clethrophobia, it can be a traumatic event. Um, and I did like the descriptions of the traumatic event. You could have been trapped in a small tunnel, deep hole, been locked in a small space, such as a closet, the trunk of a car, or an abandoned refrigerator. <laughs> so <laughs> if you were sure. specifically trapped in any of those as a kid, you might have clethrophobia. So you are happy to go into a confined space, but if you get stuck, you're like, nah, no bueno. So then you start panicking. Whereas claustrophobia is the panic before you actually go into a small space. So I would I would imagine that a lot of people who get those will think they get claustrophobia completely and utterly mixed up with cleth. Cleth? 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 I say cleth because it's an EI. So yeah, I'm saying cleth. cleth. But, um, yeah, that's right. It can be, you know, it can be one and the same occasionally because mm. you might be slightly nervous about entering that space and have a panic attack when you're in there. So yeah. that's kind of both. Um, but, yeah. I mean, today we'll probably be looking at a little bit of both. Yeah, yeah. well, before we start, Kate, are you? do you have either of these phobias? Can I tell you? I do. <laughs> really, really specific. I've got all of them, Dom. <laughs> Shitting brick share circle. Just write me up. I've got all of them. No, I, can I tell you one of my biggest fear, and it's claustrophobia because I feel, I, I think about it before it happens. Yeah. I panic. I have quite broad shoulders um, and I also have um, not particularly well-functioning shoulders. So they are not particularly flexible. So I can't, you know, I can't lie on my back and put my arms above my head and have my arms on the floor. Like they're just, it's super tight. There's a lot going on. Anyway. Okay. Boring. You'll never get that 30 seconds of your life back. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so if I have a dress, a top or something like that, and I take it off over my head, and it gets stuck on my shoulders or my back, uh, I'm done. Like I will oh. freak out. I, am, I do not like it. I know it's silly because you can still breathe. Like you can, it's fine. There's obviously the top, but I, there's been many times my siblings, my mum, they can attest to this. If it's going to be slightly tight, like coming off, I will just like bend at the hips and they just need to yank it off as Thank fast you. as they can because I will freak out. So I'm definitely claustrophobic. <laughs> specific wow. to things over my head and my arms being trapped so that's my a real goodness. big one like, it makes me like a bit sweaty just like talking about the idea of being stuck <laughs> in a tight dress or something it freaks me the out. <laughs> sorry i'm enjoying lip reading though I can't hear you. My computer literally oh. just fucking shat itself. It just shit itself. It was good though because I enjoyed watching you watching you <laughs> just go for fuck's sake. <laughs> That's okay though. It was perfect because we're at a point where you were just about to start talking about. What? 
What do you mean? What does that even fucking mean? <laughs> like, get your shit sorted, you. What a time. Oh, I can't hear you again. Can't we just have one recording situation where she I know. does not go to fucking hell? Like, I know. This is why I can't wait to start our Patreon so we can get studio time and, what, like, actually just go to a studio. What do you mean core audio is not available? Like, that's not even English. <laughs> what does that mean? Okay, hold on. It's like nothing actually happened. No one pressed mm. anything. It's just no, my it computer just, just went. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, thank you. Was it because of that? Um... Are you still recording your audio? Yeah, I am. No, no, Do you want no, me to doesn't pause or just... no? was curious okay all right it is likely to now be working okay yes we're good to go we're good to go awesome <laughs> so Dom, what about you do you have cleithrophobia or claustrophobia i love having this i love people asking this question because i think this is like one of my guilty pleasures Oh, I love being afraid of like small and confined spaces, but yep. instead of going against it, I'm like, put me in a cave, like in the pitch dark where I can't see anything or Ooh. tell me to squeeze through a really tight gap. And I'm like, bring it on. And it scares, like I get, I can get panicky about it, but I'm like, yeah let's go like okay. i don't know it's a really weird sick obsession but i'm, I'm kind of it's a love hate thing so i think maybe then you're cleithrophobic like you've got cleithrophobic because you could go into you're happy to like no worries like you get a little bit thing but you're like bring it on i'm happy to do it as long as i can escape there that's fine i won't die yeah but then i imagine if you're in there and you start to get a bit stuck you get a bit panicky yeah, I, I've had moments where that's happened and, you know, the, the anxiety goes through the roof and you're like, <laughs> oh, holy shit, like I'm out in the middle of nowhere or nobody's around, I, you know, but like my survival sort of mode kicks in. I have a really quick story, but I do geocaching. Do you know what geocaching is? It's like an app where you find hidden treasure all around the globe. Oh, um, it's really cool. It's like orienteering, but for adults or whatever. And there's billions of them all over the globe. Where If you open the app right now, there's probably 10 around your house. That's it's really amazing. cool. But anyway, we were up in Lolo and Kane found one that was in an abandoned mine oh. in the area. And you have to literally crawl through a hole about that big. Oh, and no. then you... you climb down into an abandoned mine and the only way in in and out is through there and there's no light no nothing and you just explore through all these tunnels and it was the scariest fucking thing but i loved it <laughs> you, okay so you, example right there that that is something that i'm going to teach you about today okay. okay that's not okay you cannot do that <laughs> even though you are with someone else <laughs> that sounds awful <laughs> right. did you get the treasure Yes, we did. Well done. Excellent. I'm I'm guessing it's like a digital treasure. No, no, no. It's like a physical little, like what? it's a lockbox or container and it's hidden and camouflaged and sometimes you have to work out puzzles in order to open it up and there's what? a little log book and you write in it and then you hide it back again for the next person to find. This is blowing my mind. We need it's to the um, best this is fucking the thing. thing ever. Holy shit. Okay, I'm going to get on that after this episode. That's a whole other thing. We'll We'll get into that. I would, <laughs> we'll get into that for our Patreon stuff because I need to hear more about this. That can be a separate story altogether. I need to know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> into our episode of 127 hours. So yes. I have taken an article uh, that was written by Katie Serena um, and it was published in 2021, so last year, and it was updated just this year in Feb. 
So mm -hmm. it's, you know, a, a recent article, um, but it's entitled Aaron Ralston and the Harrowing True Story of 127 Hours. Ooh. The film came out in 2010. <laughs> so as Katie writes, after seeing the 2010 film 127 Hours, Aaron Ralston called it so factually accurate, it's as close to a documentary as you can get and still be a drama. And he added that he thinks it was the best film ever made, which, Ooh. fair enough. He's probably a touch biased. Um, <laughs> I personally think it's The Godfather Part Two, but that's me. Uh, <laughs> starring James Franco as a climber who is forced to amputate his own arm after a canyoneering accident, 127 hours, called caused several viewers to pass out when they saw Franco's character dismembering himself. There were even more, they were even more horrified to realise that 127 Hours was a true story. Mm -hmm. Aaron Ralston was far from horrified. In fact, he sat in the theatre watching the story unfold. He was one of the only people who knew exactly how Franco's character must have felt during this ordeal. After all, Franco's story was a drama, dramatization, a depiction of more than five days that Aaron Ralston himself spent trapped inside of a Utah canyon. Before his infamous 2003 canyoneering accident, Aaron Ralston was just an ordinary young man with a passion for rock climbing. Good on Love you, Aaron. It. He was born on October 27th, 1975, and he grew up in Ohio before he finally moved to Colorado in 1987. Years later, he went to Carnegie Mellon University. It just makes me think of like a fruit punch. Yeah. Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he studied <laughs> mechanical engineering, good to keep in the back of your mind, French and piano, not so useful in the bottom of a canyon, but maybe the first one is. Uh, he then moved to the southwest to work as an engineer, but five years in he was like, nah, corporate's not for me. Uh, so he quit his job to devote more time to mountaineering. He wanted to climb Denali, the highest peak in North America. In 2002, Aaron Ralston moved to Aspen, Colorado to climb full-time. His goal uh, as preparation for Denali was to climb all of Colorado's 14ers uh, or mountains that were at least 14,000 feet tall, and there's 59 of them. Oh, so okay. he's like, I'm going to climb 59 mountains just to prepare for another really big mountain. I, I mean, <laughs> as you can tell from that tone, I don't really understand the mountaineering thing, but... I'm sure that, that, like, that's an incredible feat. Like, hats off. Did he do um, all 59 of them? <laughs> well, we'll find out. Mm. Uh, he wanted to do them solo, bow, bow, and in the winter, idiot, a feat that had never been recorded before. So he's oh. all about, like, huge challenges. He's about, I want to do this on my own and I want to, like, break records. Um, yeah. I want to challenge myself to the, the, you know, the best thing that I can and mountaineering's my jam. In February 2003, while backcountry skiing on Resolution Peak in Colorado with two friends, Ralston was caught in an avalanche. He was buried up to his neck in snow. Claustrophobia, anyone? Mm -hmm. uh, one fr friend dug him out and the other they rescued, uh, or, and together they rescued their third friend. Um, Ralston said later on that it was horrible and it really should have killed us. That yeah. avalanche should have killed us. No one was seriously hurt, but the incident perhaps should have triggered some self-reflection. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say that myself, but... <laughs> I know. A severe avalanche warning had been issued that day, and if oh. Ralston and his friends had seen it before climbing the mountain, they could have avoided that dangerous situation altogether. But after that, whilst most climbers might have taken steps to be more careful, Ralston did the opposite. He kept climbing and exploring hazardous terrain and oftentimes he was completely on his own. Smart cookie this one is. Well, it's just, it's a red flags already, like red flags. <laughs> just a few months after the avalanche, Aaron Ralston travelled to southeastern Utah to explore Canyonlands National Park on April 25th, 2003. He slept in his truck that night and at 9.15 the next morning, a beautiful sunny Saturday, he rode his bicycle 15 miles to Blue John Canyon, which is an 11-mile long gorge uh, that in some places measures just three feet wide. So, you know, that's not very wide. I've done it. Well, we've done our measurement episodes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a few bottles. You'll get a good it. Yeah, buzz. it's a few wine bottles, yeah. <laughs> So he's ridden his bike 15 miles uh, to this gorge. The 27-year-old then locked his bike up and walked towards the canyon's opening. At around 2.45 p.m., 
As he descended the canyon, a giant rock above him slipped. The next thing he knew, his right arm was lodged between an 800-pound boulder and the canyon wall. Ralston was also trapped 100 feet below the surface and 20 miles away from the nearest paved road. Oh, fuck me. I just got sick. Mm. Like... So this is on the first day. So he's slept in his truck. He's woken up on the Saturday morning. He's like, great day for some mountaineering. Mm. Gets on his little bicycle, locks it up. And then 2.45 that afternoon, as he's pretty much, you know, starting off going down into the canyon is when it happened. The rock fell and pinned his right arm. That's a so, nice boulder. That's a nice boulder. <laughs> uh, had that, that movie wouldn't have come out yet. This is 2003. When did Shrek come out? You continue and I will, I will research yeah. for you. Because you've got to think, like, you'd make that joke, wouldn't you? If <laughs> you were trapped against a boulder, would you? I would have. It's a 2001 film. So, yeah. Oh, oh my I gosh. totally would have made that totally. joke to myself. In Same. Oh, look at that boulder. That's a nice boulder. I like All what right. you do with that boulder. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dominic, to make yeah. matters worse... <laughs> Aaron didn't tell anybody about his climbing plans. All right. Well, fuck right off, Mr. This is what I'm saying. Like, come on, mate. And then so he's down there. He's stuck. He hasn't told anybody where he's going and he didn't have any way to signal for help. So he doesn't have a phone. He doesn't, you know, have anything that's a, a GPS tracker, a flare gun, <laughs> nothing like that. But he first things first, he wants to inter invent inventory his, his provisions. So he had two burritos some candy bar crumbs and a bottle of water. Okay. Well, so, I mean, he has some food. Something. I find two burritos. Like, was he planning on just going hiking for the day? I would assume he's. And yeah. burritos is an interesting choice. Well, like beans. Sandwich? Beans do oh, give you a lot of energy, energy and stuff like that. And, you know, That's Americans true. love burritos. Like, it's just burrito everything. So. Burrito city. Excellent. Okay. Well, he's got two burritos. He's got some some crumbs and some water. Okay. Um, whilst he's trapped there, he's like, okay, well, I'm clearly stuck. I can't move this thing. It's giant. My arm's stuck. Um, so he grabbed, uh, you know, what he could and just started to like chip away at the boulder, but yeah. it's futile. It makes no difference. Doesn't do anything. And then eventually uh, he ran out of water and he was forced to drink his own urine. Which, which is. Yep. Exactly, Dom. I was about to say. <laughs> Preach, <laughs> put up on our socials. You should not do that. It will make <laughs> you more dehydrated. It will make you feel worse. Uh, early on, so he's, he's you know he's down there. He's had his burrito. He's you know having a time. Um, he doesn't have any water left. <laughs> then he considered cutting off his arm. So he experimented with tourniquets, and he made some superficial cuts to test the knife sharpness. Uh, but he didn't know how he was going to saw through the bone, basically. Um, he just had a cheap multi-tool as well. This is the kind of thing where he said, if you bought a $15 flashlight, you would get this knife for free. Oh, so God. It's like, you can imagine, this is a crap little, like something you get in a Christmas cracker almost. Like, it's not, yeah. it's not a fancy pants, hunting, hiking, fancy Bear Grylls sit show. This is a cheap little crappy multi-tool. Yeah, she's not packing a machete or anything. Uh -uh, nothing. Now, distraught and delirious, Aaron Ralston resigned himself to his fate. He used his dull tools to carve his name into the canyon wall, along with his birth date, his presumed date of death, and the letters RIP. Then he used a video camera to tape goodbyes to his family and he tried to just go to sleep. That night, sorry, you were going to say. Sorry, I need to pause for a second. Please. Okay. If you are, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm covering, coming for Aaron a little bit. And <laughs> You're welcome to. Wait until I talk about the next guy. You can come for him all day long. Okay, but I'm in a feisty mood today. But Do if it. you are so fucking narcissistic to bring a fucking video camera so you can film yourself being a douchebag climber, <laughs> but you don't bring a phone, you don't bring any sort of safety equipment, anything to do the job properly, and you don't tell anyone, you go right ahead and make your fucking... Make your vid. Make your video, whatever the fuck, and then don't come crying to me, Argentina, when a fucking boulder's <laughs> come for you. Like, 
That pisses me off. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Look, and I'm sure, yeah, he wanted to make his, his sick sick vids. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's a time. Like, tell someone, take a phone, take a GPS tracker. I don't know. Isn't that like, he's obviously experienced. He was buried neck deep in an avalanche five minutes yeah. ago. And now he's going and doing the, it doesn't seem he's learning. From I think it's just why I'm getting feisty about it. Like, That's obviously, right. it's a horrible thing. And I, 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 I don't want to put him up on as a pedestal as a perfect example of human civilization and his like it's inspirational to a to an extent, but it's also like I don't want to reward stupidity here. And yes, I get you. I hear what you're saying for sure. And I feel I feel for him like it's a horrible situation, which is why I'm angry on the on behalf of his pre bolder self. Yes. Yeah. Smack, pre bolder. Smack, smack. Yeah. Post bolder self. I'm like, PB, okay, PB. Yeah. yeah. I get you. I really do. Now, this next part, I was like, Katie, did you, did this really happen? Or is this, did he just say this afterwards? I don't know. But anyway, so he's carved his name into the rock wall. He's taped his goodbyes to his families and friends. He's trying just to go to sleep and, you know, never wake up again. Yeah. And then that night, as he's drifting in and out of consciousness, he dreamt of himself with only half of his right arm and he was playing with a child. Oh. So I don't know if that's legit, but, like, it's cute for the story. So he's dreamt, you know, I'm alive and I'm playing with a kid and he woke up and he believed that it was a sign that he was going to survive and he would have a family. Um, and that actually made him, like, more determined than ever. So he was yeah. like, I'm not going to die now. I'm up. I'm ready to go. How can I get out of this? How can I survive? And his survival instinct went into overdrive, which that I find, you know, I don't know exactly how it happened, but there's got to be some way that got him into a mental state to do what he is about to do. Yeah, like I, whatever, I'm give benefit of the doubt here. If that's what's going to get you to, to do what you're about to do, then power to you. At least he didn't dream about having like a Netflix special or a, multi-million dollar movie made after him and he's like yeah yeah i've got to do this now I've like, do it. yeah exactly yes that's right now the dream of a future family left aaron rolson with an epiphany he didn't need to cut through his bones he could break them instead yeah so i think like yeah that's that's smart you're never going to cut through your bone you'd be there until bloody 2020 if you're you know trying to do that it's so, not a good time to snap out of it. Maybe should have... oh, 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 oh. <laughs> snap out of it. <laughs> we are sassy today. We are so sassy, guys. Make sure you send us an email. <laughs> Don't at me. <laughs> I will come for you. Uh, using the uh, the talk from his trapped arm. So basically, yeah, trying to. You no, know, he's an engineer. He knows mm. which way he needs to bend his arm to potentially get some certain force and whatever yeah. the, the case is. But using the torque from his trapped arm, he managed to break his ulna Ooh. and his radius. Cool. So he's broken the two bones in his arm. After his bones were disconnected, oh, that's not a natural sentence, he fashioned a tourniquet from uh, the tubing of his camelback water bottle, mm. which cut off the circulation entirely. Great. You'd want that. Uh, then he was able to use his cheap, dull two-inch knife to cut through his skin and muscle and a pair of pliers to get rid of the tendons. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. You're welcome, everyone, having brekkie or lunch or din, <laughs> sozzy. But, I mean, yeah. like, you knew that was coming. Like, if you know anything about the movie, you know that happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's what gets me, Kate. It's It's not so much anything else about the story it's just i am really fidgety when it comes to Ooh. uh injury and blood and bone and stuff like that like yep. nothing makes me queasier than than I that know. so having to do it on yourself like yeah i'll give credit where credit's due you got to be you got to have a lot of guts to do that oh yeah for sure now this i found fascinating so he really thought about this because he left his arteries until last so he identified the main arteries and he didn't touch them until last. So he didn't just go like hack job and, yeah. you know, slash away at every. He, he really thought about this and he did this in a way that was going to help him survive. Um, so he left them till last and he, yeah, 
basically knew that he wouldn't have much time after he, he snipped those ones. And he said, all the desires, joys and euphorias of a future life came rushing into me. Maybe this is how I handled the pain. I was so happy to be taking action. Mm. The entire process took an hour, oh. during which blah, during which Ralston lost 25% of his blood volume. Mm. He was so high on adrenaline that he climbed out of the slot canyon. He rappelled down a 65-foot sheer cliff and he hiked six of the eight miles back to his car all while dehydrated, losing blood, and one-handed. Oh, that's a lot of adrenaline, baby. Yeah. Six miles into his hike, he met a family from the Netherlands who had been hiking in the canyon. They gave him Oreos and water, and they contacted the authorities because they had a phone. Come on, Aaron, get it together. Canyonlands officials had been alerted that Ralston was missing and they were searching the area by helicopter, but that was futile because he was trapped below the surface of the canyon. So they would mm. have just been flying around and around, but you can't see him. He was in this little three feet wide gap that went yeah. down into, you know, one of the, the slot canyons. So four hours after amputating his arm, Ralston was rescued by medics. They believed that the timing could not have been more perfect. Had Ralston amputated his arm any sooner, he probably would have bled to death. And if he waited any longer, he probably would have died in the canyon. Mm. So he just like, you have to kind of think, and whatever you believe in, that's something. Like that's a divine intervention. That's a, you know, he's literally had this fever dream, this self, like half conscious, seen himself playing with a kid and he wants a family and that's snapped him out of it. And then he's, you know, done all yeah. of this work. It's taken an hour manifested and the, it and that's just right the luck it. of running into that family from the netherlands and yeah it's pretty phenomenal that yeah it's, yeah they were the medics were like blown away they're like dude you an hour either side and this would have been a completely different story um so following his rescue his severed lowered arm and hand were retrieved by park rangers from beneath the gigantic boulder but here we go it took 13 <laughs> 13 ranges, a hydraulic jack, and a winch to remove the boulder, which would not have been possible if the rest of Rolson's body was still there too. Oh. So because of the position of it and where he was and then if they tried to save him by doing that, they probably would have, you know, might have killed him. They don't think it would have been possible. So it's all of it just kind of adds up to like this, you know, this guy was obviously meant to live. He lived in ridiculous circumstances yeah absolutely so these rangers bless them they picked up his little <laughs> part of his arm um and they cremated it and they gave it back to him so they were like here you go bud here's a little dilly bag of ashes <laughs> <That's> your arm <laughs> Enjoy. i don't know what you want to do with it but um and six months later on his 28th birthday he went back to that canyon and he scattered the ashes there so his arm stays there now this ordeal of course sparked international intrigue along with the film dramatization of his life with which Ralston says is so accurate it might be a docu might as well be a documentary Ralston appeared on television morning shows late night specials and press tours through it all he was in good spirits as for that dream of a full life that sparked his incredible escape it came true Ralston is now a father of two who hasn't slowed down despite, um, sorry, I don't know why I find this funny, but it's just turned into this like, you know, puff piece <laughs> towards the end here. Uh, a father of two hasn't slowed down at all despite losing a large portion of his arm. As far as climbing goes, he hasn't even taken a break. In 2005, he became the first person to climb all 59 Colorado's 14ers alone and in the snow and one-handed. So he did Ugh. what he wanted to do. Did he bring a fucking phone with him? <laughs> you would hope so. You really would hope so. Okay. Uh, Aaron Ralston has often praised the film version of his true story, which is Danny Boyle's 2010 movie, 127 Hours, as brutally realistic. However, the arm cutting scene did need to be shortened to a few minutes uh, because, you know, it was an hour in real life, but that would have been a, a real mood killer if it was just an hour of someone packing up there with a little Swiss arm. I mean, Not even a Swiss army, a knife. Knife. 
Now, this scene also required three prosthetic arms made to look exactly like the outside of James, James Franco's arm. And uh, Franco didn't hold back when he reacted in the movie as well. And he said that he, so Franco has a, a problem with blood. Like he doesn't particularly like the sight of blood and he doesn't yeah. really like it on his hands or arms. So this was a bit of an issue. Um, so basically on the first day, he just reacted pretty much naturally. And that was the take they used. Um, he wasn't supposed to cut it all the way through on the first take, uh, but he did. And <laughs> he just cut it off and then like fell backwards. And that was like, yep, cool, done. That's the take we'll use. Thank you very much. Uh, other than the accuracy of events in the film, Ralston also praised 127 hours of its honest depiction of his emotions during the five-day ordeal. He was glad that the filmmakers were okay with including a smiling Franco at the moment that he realised he could break his own arm to get free. Ralston said, I had to hound the team to make sure that smile made it into the film, but I'm really happy it did. You can see that smile. It was a triumphant moment and I was smiling when I did it. Wow. So okay. that was his that was his jam. He was smiling and he was happy that he could actually do something. From the helplessness to I'm gonna survive and I'm gonna take control of this situation. He he smiled when he yeah, broke his arm off. Yeah, I mean I can, honestly I can imagine the extremes of those emotions, right? Like mm -hmm. The, the terror, the 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 despair, the everything, and then also the quite sort of bipolar nature of being so ecstatic that something can oh, yeah. be done. Definitely. Like, yeah, I I could totally imagine that. I just um yeah. Mm. Now that is my little 127 hours portion, but we're not over yet because I want to share a couple of other stories that are complementary to Aaron Ralston's story. Oh, uh, some little nuggets. Some little nugs. The next story I want to talk about, and we, <laughs> uh, you can, Dom, I would love to hear your opinion on this as I'm reading through it, but here we go. Okay. <laughs> Eaton Shaket. Eaton was an Israeli hiker that fell from a glacier in southern, uh, southern Argentina and lay injured and freezing, almost certain he was going to die. So he began to record his thoughts. So he has got a phone, this kid. He's just recording his thoughts. Mm. In Hebrew, Eaton, who was hiking alone when he fell, oh, you all can see the lesson that's coming at the end of this episode, obviously. Yep. He admitted to making a mistake, saying that he was in pain and he was trying to be positive and hoping he got rescued. And then in English, he addressed those that might find his frozen body and his phone. He said, please contact my mother. Her name is Mother in my contacts. <laughs> oh. Sorry. Um, Ashaken, 23, said through shivers in one of the videos, his right eye covered in blood, uh, I'm freezing, please contact my mum. Do whatever you can. Oh. So that's cute. Like he's thinking of mum. I really like that he had to point out, like, it's mum in my contacts, please. Yeah. 24 hours after he fell, Local rescuers hoisted him from the bottom of the glacier and he was flown to hel by helicopter to a local hospital. So 24 hours. I mean, it was cold, but yeah. it was 127. No, but like, 24 hours in the cold, like, true. hey, at least Aaron wasn't cold and had water and, like... I love this. We are doing a full flip. I am so anti Eaton, and you're anti Aaron for this pod. I think Eaton is, like... Saw 127, 127 hours and was like, this is my moment to shine. <laughs> See, but record my videos. Eaton's got a phone and True. and he's apologised and he's like, I made a mistake. I haven't heard fucking Aaron think that he's made a fucking mistake, the douchebag. Like, <laughs> seriously. Oh, this is going to be the next poll. Like, who's side? <laughs> Whose side are you on? Like, no, I was trying I to be know, nice, no, but I, no, no, I'm no, just... no, I'm so I'm, no, I completely agree. I like it. I I like adding a bit of spice to our pod. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 24 hours later, Eaton was rescued and he was taken to hospital. Good for him. And then he posted uh, there. He posted those videos. So the ones he took, he posted to um, his socials, essentially. Mm. The story of his near death and subsequent res rescue, rescue. rescue. <laughs> rescue quickly made the news in Argentina and was picked up by international uh, news media. The original Instagram post now has over 2,000 likes. 
Sharkhead explained in the Instagram post uh, that the accident took place while he was hiking alone uh, in a glacier at the southernmost tip of Argentina um, in a spot that is often called the end of the world. Mm. Sharkhead had been travelling around South America after finishing his military service in Israel. Now, he was diagnosed at the hospital with a fractured pelvis uh, and Ooh. elbow along with other injuries. You can't cut you that up, off. No, you cannot. And if you look up his uh, if this story online, you can see the picture he took. He does, like, it's clear he hit his head and his eye is, like, quite swollen, quite bloody, quite yuck. Like, he's Ooh. taken a legit fall. If you're smashing your pelvis, you're taking a legit fall. Yeah. Um, but he was expected to recover, which is good. Now, the um, group who saved Sharkhead later posted on Facebook about the rescue. They said that the mountain guide heard someone shouting for help um, and the cries came from a difficult place to, place to access. Seven rescuers using cords and a stretcher managed to reach Sharkhead after several hours and then they took him to the hospital. But they all said, what we want to teach as a result of this unfortunate event is the importance of always undertaking excursions in the wild accompanied. Mm. Don't underestimate the mountain. Yeah. Hello. Sure. Love that there's a learnings from this. Don't see Aaron making any learnings from this. He went and Come did on, 59 Abba. mountains by himself, one-handed, alone. Like... Oh. I get it. I know. All right. I'm taking another turn. We're going down okay. another path. Let's Here we go. It. Those people that did underestimate the mountain are some of the stories I'm going to really briefly touch on from a little cliff called Mount Everest. Have you Ooh, heard of it? I've heard of it. Heard of it. Now, there have been over 200 climbing deaths on Mount Everest. 200. Very dangerous. Very serious. There's a lot going yeah. on. However, what I didn't know, and this is something I learned, and, I mean, it makes sense, but I, I wanted to just share this because it's news to me. Many of the bodies are still on Mount Everest and they serve as a reminder for those that, that follow. Mm. Uh, Mount Everest, if you don't know, it holds the impressive title of tallest mountain in the world, uh, but many people don't know about its other more gruesome title, the world's largest open-air graveyard. Yeah. Since 1953, when Edmund, oh, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay scaled the summit for the first time, over 4,000 people have followed in their footsteps, braving the harsh climate and dangerous terrain for a few moments of glory. Some of them, however, never left the mountain. The top portion of the mountain, roughly everything above 26,000 feet, is known as the death zone. There, the oxygen levels are only at a third of what they are at sea level, and the um, barometric pressure causes weight to feel 10 times heavier. The combination mm. of the two makes climbers feel sluggish, disorientated, fatigued, and can cause extreme distress on your organs. For this reason, climbers don't usually last more than 48 hours in this area. The climbers that do are usually left with lingering effects. The ones that aren't, uh, aren't so lucky, are left where they fall. So. Like, firstly, if this isn't a brochure for a holiday, I, d I don't want to go to there. It's like, go here and, like, oh, it's going to feel 10 times heavier. You won't be able to breathe. Your organs are going to explode, but have fun. Just yeah. to, get a, what, to get a picture, I, I need to speak to someone who's got a keen interest in this. Actually, I know someone off the top of my head, someone I, I used to work with, he's a keen climber. I'll have to ask him because that's his, one of his goals, and I just wonder why. Yeah, no, I, I won't say I'm probably as keen as your friend. Like, yeah. if I could and I was a bit younger, I would probably attempt it. Like, mm -hmm. I'd say I'm I'm that keen, but I know I'm never going to do it necessarily. No, 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 I probably won't ever do it. But I know a lot about the topic of Mount Everest, and I understand that everyone, A, is super, super respectful of the dangers and all that sort of stuff. And if anyone ever decided to pull up, I'm going to go by myself, I'm going to, you know, that just no one would take that person legitimate and A, you wouldn't even be allowed to go. I believe mm. that they wouldn't let you try and attempt something because it's stupid. But I did some quick math for you, Kate, because I know uh -oh. you like your math. I love math. I'm not and good at it, but I love it. Talking about your brochure, I did yeah. some quick math and if there's roughly 4,000 people have done it and 200 people have died, that's a 5% chance of death. Amazing. 
I mean, not amazing. You don't want a 5% <laughs> chance of death, but yeah, okay. That makes sense. I like it. Thank you for doing that. Mm. Uh, now, standard protocol on Mount Everest is to leave the dead where they died. So uh, their corpses, you know, basically just stay there. And they serve, serve as a warning for other climbers. Um, so they're basically like mile markers, but dead bodies. Mm. One of the most famous corpses, which we will post a photo of this on our socials, he was known as Green Boots. It was passed by almost every climber to reach the death zone. The identity of Green Boots is highly contested, but it's most wildly believed that it is Sewang Paljor, uh, Indian climber, who died in 1996. Before the body's recent removal, Green Boots' body rested near a cave that all climbers must pass on their way to the peak. The body became a grim landmark used to gauge how close one is to the summit. Mm. He is famous for his Green Boots, shock, uh, because according to one seasoned adventurer, about 80% of people also take a rest at the shelter where Green Boots is. It's hard to miss the person lying there. You need to see this picture because it is a person lying face down in the snow. And yeah. that was a human being. And people just sit and have their cup of tea near him. I it's I it blows, I love it. It blows my mind. It just this story really got me. I really enjoyed it. Now in 2006, another climber joined Green Boots in his cave, sitting arms around his knees in the corner forever. David Sharp was attempting to summit Everest on his own. Oh, <laughs> A feat which even the most advanced climbers would warn against. No shit. Uh, he had stopped to rest in Green Boots Cave, as so many had done before him. Over the course of several hours, he froze to death. His body stuck in huddled position, just a few feet from one of the most famous Mount Everest bodies. Unlike Green Boots, however, who had likely gone unnoticed during his death because of the small people hiking when that when he died, mm. at least 40 people passed by David Sharp that day, and not one of them stopped. Sharp's death sparked a moral debate about the culture of Everest climbers. Yeah. So many had passed Sharp as he lay dying and their eyewitness accounts claim that he was visibly alive and in distress. Nobody offered to help. So Edmund Hillary, the first man to summit the mountain, he criticised those climbers um, and attributed it to their mind-numbing desire to reach the top. Yep. So Edmund said, if you have someone who's in great need and you're still strong and energ energetic, then you have a duty to give all you can and get that man down and getting to the summit becomes secondary. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the whole attitude towards climbing Mount Everest has become rather horrifying. People just want to get to the top. They don't give a damn for anybody else who might be in distress. And it doesn't impress me at all that they leave someone lying under a rock to die. Yep. Amen. Yeah. Preach, yeah. Sir Edmund. No, Sir Edmund. The media term this phenomenon summit fever, and it's happened more times than people realise. In 1999, the oldest known body was found on Everest. George Mallory's body was found 75 years after his 1924 death, after an unusually warm spring. Mallory had attempted to be the first person to climb Everest, though he disappeared before anybody found out. His body was found in 99, his upper torso, half of his legs and his left arm almost perfectly preserved. Wow. He was dressed in a tweed suit and surrounded by primitive climbing equipment and heavy oxygen bottles. A rope injury around his waist led people to believe that he had been roped to another climber when he fell from the side of a cliff. Ooh. It is still unknown whether Mallory made it to the top, though, of course, the title of first man ever has been attributed elsewhere. Uh, although he may not have made it, uh, rumours of Mallory's climb swirled around for years. He was a famous mountaineer at the time, and when he was asked why he wanted to climb the mountain, he famously replied, because it's there. Yeah. So, <laughs> why wouldn't I? It's there, of course. Now, one of the most horrifying sights on Mount Everest is the body of Hannelore Schmatz. In 1979, Schmatz became not only the first German citizen to perish on the mountain, but also the first woman. Schmatz had actually reached her goal of summiting the mountain before ultimately succumbing to exhaustion on the way down. Mm. Despite her Sherpa's warning, she set up camp within the death zone. She managed to survive a snowstorm hitting overnight and made it almost the rest of the way down uh, before lack of oxygen and frostbite resulted in her giving into exhaustion. She was only 330 feet from base oh. camp. Now her body remains on the mountain. It is extremely well preserved because of the below zero temperatures. And she remained in plain view of the mountain's southern route, leaning against a long deteriorated backpack 
with her eyes open and her hair blowing in the wind until 70 to 80 mile per hour winds either blew a covering snow a covering of snow over her or pushed her off the mountain. Her final resting place is unknown. I'm I've got to we're going to post a picture of her as well because that is the spookiest one. It is it literally looks like a mannequin because she was leaning on a backpack when she died. The backpack yeah. it's deteriorated and gone, so she's just leaning like in a half sort of sitting up position, frozen and like yeah. It is due to the same things that kill these climbers that recovery of their bodies can't take place. When someone dies on Everest, especially in the death zone, it's almost impossible to retrieve the body. The weather conditions, the terrain, the lack of oxygen makes it difficult to get the bodies off. And even if they can be found, they're usually stuck to the ground, frozen in place. Like they cannot get them off. They basically, yeah, it's, it's hard. In fact, two rescuers died while trying to recover Schmutz's body and countless others have perished while trying to reach the rest. Despite the risks mm. and the bodies they encounter, thousands of people flock to Everest every year in attempt, uh, in an attempt uh, to well, to attempt one of the most impressive feats known to man today. I was going to ask Kate, like, why does nobody rescue or capture get the bodies? But yeah. I didn't realize I, that it's that still that dangerous even 300 absolutely. feet from base camp oh for sure for sure and it's just the other side of it too because it's so it's so dangerous because their bodies would are quite literally hard frozen to the ground the same yeah. as a rock would be the same as a you know so they have to i guess you know i don't even know pickaxe blow torches or whatever that may be but that takes time and the longer that you're up and in those conditions and using oxygen or or being in that freezing in those freezing conditions like that's putting other people at risk too so it's yeah. just too dangerous and that's why they say heaps of people have died trying to get to the bodies um and then yeah they just sort of get covered in snow or they like it defrost and they roll down the hill or i don't know it's just it's wild Oof. wowza so what is the moral of today's story dominic <laughs> tell me the survival <laughs> please tell me the survival tip of today look I've been harsh and I understand that. I appreciate the the skill and, and, and venturesome spirit because I have a slight speck of it myself. I really do. But I just, I don't think there's the moment that it turns into I'm going to actively make this more dangerous or harder just to have a title. Yeah. I think is completely self-serving and you don't, that's not going to bring you fulfillment or happiness, you know, it I just, it. it absolutely won't. So I would just say, follow the rules and suggestions yes. of the people that have been doing this, like the Sherpas, by the way, who yeah. know this mountain and the culture and the history that surrounds it. Yeah. You know, do whatever the hell they say. I agree. I absolutely agree. And the other thing, you know, the number one, don't go by yourself. Do not go by yourself. Come on, guys, get it together. So that is your phobia story and your uh, survival tip of the week. Well now done. You be, thank you. You might be thinking, but Kate, what about pop culture? Well, I could share that with you, but I feel like it's almost an episode in and of itself. <laughs> Our movie of the week is Vertical Limit. Ooh. which is the 2000 American survival thriller. Martin Campbell directed it. He also directed Goldeneye. He's an action movie guy. I'm not going to go into heaps of deets because, you know, it's time for you all to go. It's time for us to go. But Vertical Limit is our movie of the week. And if you keep your peepers peeled for some Patreon, maybe we will bloody talk about it then. So just set yourselves up for some more joy. Oh, Kate. Okay. Talk about mic drop. What an episode. <laughs> I enjoy that. That bodies one was great. And we will post the photos of those bodies. It's it's terrifying, mm. especially even Green Boots. I think he's my most horrifying one. But make sure you engage with us, guys, on socials. We love you so much. And just reach out, have a listen, tell someone about us. Um, we love you. Yeah, we love you. Well done, Kate. Epic episode. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I've survived uh, Kotal and Death Island from last week, but we'll Fingers see. Crossed. <sighs> Ooh. Bye. Ooh. I love you so much. I love you. Love you. Love everyone. Just love. Feel the love. <laughs> you are such a dag. Oh, I'm such a dag. All right. And save. <laughs>